shamelessly borrowed this slide from Louis Yonder, as you can see, you can see the different rules in here. But since we work a lot, segmentation, sensing, prediction, resolution, parameter tuning, root cause analytics, right? So a lot of the different things that we were just talking about, what is customer segmentation? Not all customers are made the same. So, you know, it's important that as a business, you realize that and you invest in segmenting your customers. Not everybody needs the same service. Not everybody costs you the same. So the mix of customers you want to fulfill, how you want to fulfill them is extremely important. So that sets the stage. Demand sensing, um, well, fancy word for I want a linear regression that Why? tells me based on mix of paths to the customers. It's a push model, right? Uh, traditional organization, everything, we need to meet our numbers, I'm going to push things to you. Push creates a lot of pain. Uh, somebody said push versus pull. Uh, it's, a, it's a very broad topic and it's a very interesting topic for all professionals in this field. Uh, mostly push, but can you still do business without pushing stuff? And that requires some kind of an integration alignment which, which, and a culture change as well, which we can talk about. Supply capacity, I mean, who hasn't dealt with supply capacity shortages, right? We can't make cars today, we can't make tractors today, we can't um, fulfill what the customer is asking. The demand far exceeds the supply capacity. Guess what, it's not as if demand just vanished and came back, it was always there. It's just that it got aggregated and bunched up in certain buckets and then the whole semiconductor and you know the whole nine yards that supported all that to make it happen uh, didn't happen. So how do you manage that? Lead times just became excessive. And then warehouses, right? So we operate in a warehouse-based system for spare parts distribution. How would we manage this gap to execute within customers' expectations? So these are our challenges which we face. Um, I just want to bring these numbers to your attention. So in the three years that we've been working with the solution suite, we have demand inventory fulfilled. Uh, we have managed to improve our customer service levels by 10%. And this was pre-pandemic, of course, um, as of today. We are somewhere between where we were three years back and where we were two years back. So we are somewhere in the middle. We're trying to come back. It's taken us two years. Whatever benefit we had, the disruption just pretty much wiped it off. Uh, response times to customers. This is before pandemic. We were able to reduce that by 40%. Inventory investment, which is your money, your capital tied up in what you do. So a lot of the focus is if I have to meet service by increasing my inventory, I mean, that's the easy thing to do. Can I, can I increase my service while keeping and lowering my inventory? And that's where the challenge of professional like you comes in. And that's where the essence of demand forecasting comes in. The more accurate you are, obviously the lower inventory you require, investment you require. Accuracy 10%. And all this while the business became more and more complex. New models getting launched, models getting obsolete. As you're aware, at Mahindra, we have launched a, a very, um, a very good set of uh, products in the market which kind of meet the need of what, what's happening. So we have increased the part count in what we do. And then the business always has to grow. It cannot be that the business has to decline. Fortunately, our business got a hit because the supply side, but the demand side was always on, the, on, on an upswing. So last year we were able to come back and still generate this, this growth which we wanted. So th this is a, a segmentation maturity model kind of a roadmap and you guys can figure out where you are on this roadmap. So you have agility, flexibility on the y-axis and you have maturity on the x-axis. So basically four different levels, rules of thumb, right? How many of you use rules of thumb in your inventory planning and your forecasting? One month of stock, I, I'll keep two months of stock. Well, I think I can manage with 15 days. Anybody? No? No? Okay. So, well, my friends, you're at level one, okay? And if it works for you, great, but it's money that you're using to make it work. Level two, customer segmentation. Level three, dynamic segmentation. And then level four is autonomous segmentation. So I've used some words here. The pointer, is this a pointer? I don't know, okay. So I've used some words here. Dynamic segmentation, unsupervised learning, right, buzzword. Uh, autonomous segmentation, supervised learning. Well. You, you're just letting somebody do some, run some algorithms to cluster your data to give you some clusters. And then you're using your Y as a function of X1, X2, X3 to try and predict what X1, X2, X3 is going to be. So it's simple things, just said differently, but it's at the end of the day, it's all your 
uh, statistical and regression models which are coming into play. What results did we see? And that's what you're concerned as a business, right? What, do you, what results do you see from something like this? So when we went to level two, which is where we started three years back, uh, service levels increased, inventory decreased, and then forecasting accuracy increased, right? We took that and we took it to unsupervised learning with pre-pandemic data, which we ran. And we realized that if we are able to use dynamic segmentation, we can further reduce our safety stocks and our safety stock value. Also, cycle stock can be reduced. See, in a traditional supply chain, your supply teams have a tendency to buffer lead times of what's going to come and when it's going to come. But when you have real data of what actual lead times you're witnessing, you have the ability to cut those as well and still deliver the service. And when we did a sample of uh, supervised learning after learning from this pre-pandemic data, we applied this to post-pandemic data and we took our spares um, planning at, at, and demand and inventory planning with post-pandemic data, lead times change, demand change, we ran the whole thing we realize that it's the other way around now. That the, the system is predicting and saying you need to keep more safety stock because you are running out and not fulfilling demand that much. Your safety stock value increased. Your cycle stocks pretty much went from 42 to 88. It just said, keep more stock. You're just not going to meet your service because of the way your, your supply is happening and your demand's coming in. The uncertainty pretty much is what led to the safety stock increase and cycle stock increase. And the uncertainty of not just demand, but of supply as well. And then um, the cycle stock value also went up significantly by 15, 20%. So it's a complete shift, right? So what we were looking at optimizing and saying, let's do less, 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 and I'll be able to still manage post pandemic, that wasn't the case. So we had to increase inventory, which I'm sure many of you already did, is build up this buffer uh, to predict this, to, to kind of meet this uh, unpredictability and uncertainty. I think there's a topic on uncertainty. It's really cool what, what you need to do in terms of demand and supply uncertainty. But uncertainty basically had to be managed and we did it by inventory. So let me talk about uh, feature selection, significance, drift and evolution. So these are again words of supervised learning and unsupervised learning. Feature selection is nothing but your factors which influence your outcome, right? So this is the x1, x2, and x3. So what I have, let me just go back. Pre-COVID without lead time, so when we had these different, so what these bars represent are the different factors which we thought influences our demand. So it's, it's trying to regress and identify which features are important to my customer, and it's trying to take it and plot it in terms of the, so the higher the bar, the more significant it is. It's not important what those are, we can talk about that separately. And then when you put lead time into the picture, we realize that it's not just the demand side which you want to use. So it's not just the frequency of demand, the average demand, um, the um, spacing between demand. When you put lead time into the picture, the lead time becomes a significant factor for you in terms of your customer service segmentation. So that was one realization. And then post COVID, when we kind of map with the same data, the same factors came in, in fact, with different levels of intensity. But then again, as you can see, the variation in demand, which is the bottom left, the lead time, and then there's, I think that's the average demand interval. All these factors became even more important for us to be able to manage this. And what we realized is that what features you think are important, um, even though human um, input will tell you what they are, but to validate that and for them to be statistically significant, you need to have your numbers running. Otherwise, it's just guesswork. A person A versus person B cannot be uh, debated and you cannot come to the right conclusion. So this is what, what our charts look like post and pre and post pandemic in terms of significance, drift and evolution. So the drift is, first we realize what's significant, right? What is significant to me? Then does the data drift? And it did, did drift, right, pre and post pandemic. And then your segmentation evolves with that drift. And that's the evolution which we are talking about here. So just a quick analysis, um, same figures. What was increasing, decreasing before pandemic is actually asking us to increase post pandemic because the market has shifted, the underlying demand supply parameters have shifted, and you have to give that importance to be able to predict and plan your inventory and supply demand post pandemic. Um, so that brings me to pretty much my last slide. Are we good on time, Ajit? Okay. 
basic segmentation, dynamic, and I'm talking about level two, three, and four, right? So when you do a basic segmentation, what is important is that you deploy a consistent framework. What you plan for demand, what you plan for inventory, and what you plan for fulfillment, those things have to be linked together. It cannot be I'm planning my demand separately, supply segmentation is separate, and my fulfillment is going to be separate. It doesn't work like that. Make sure you implement all your inventory and forecasting algorithms. So um, when I work with our Blue Yonder team, when we started off, we started off with two algorithms. We said, well, we need to use six algorithms. There's a lot of variation in different types of demands which come. One inventory model, we went to three inventory models. And when we move to dynamic segmentation, you need to identify features which are important to you. Okay, that's a science. It's, it's an art, but also a science. So you need to have enough data to validate what is important and differentiates your customer segment. So your different customers have different needs. The quicker you, adapt, you identify and isolate that, the better off you are in terms of planning the offerings for them. And each feature, so I'm, let's just take a, when I say a feature, feature is a variable. A variable can have multiple levels, right? High, medium, low, just a, a simple categorical example. Um, you need to simulate all features. So you'll see um, high, medium, low for one factor, high, medium, low for another factor. You have interactions between them too, so your model can tell you that that high for this factor, low for this factor creates this cluster versus low and medium will create that cluster. You need to simulate all possible outcomes. And when you have these outcomes, your clusters change, your boundaries get redefined, and what you believe is your true customer segment might be very different from what the data tells you actually. So it's better that you don't let um, human judgment drive that, but you let data drive that to define what, what's happening. And then the autonomous segmentation is I'm in pilot mode, right? I'm in cruise control, but then cruise control post validating your data, post validating a hypothesis. The segmentation rules will prescribe what you do. So no longer it is going to ask you that, well, this is what's happening, so can I do something about it? It will segment your data. It will also prescribe what you need to do if your variables are vari uh, the values of your inputs. All you need to do is give those inputs, okay? I'm going to have this much sales plan from this territory, this much uh, is my market share, and it's going to crunch and tell you what you need to do. Um, anytime something changes in your business um, and you feel there's some shift, you need to keep validating new variables that impact your business. You need to keep testing your hypothesis, right? Um, hypothesis testing, A, A slash B, conditional probability. If I'm going to do B, then what's going to be my A? If, if, if I'm going to have this product out there, what is going to be my outcome? You need to keep doing that and keep validating that. And then um, you, no longer, you no longer calculate and say, I'm going to give you this much service. You predict and say, I know in advance, if I do this, this, and this, I can predict my outcome, and I'm going to commit to my customer. I'm going to deliver the product to you at that level of fulfillment in this much time. So that prediction can also happen. And that is where you truly align your demand, supply, and fulfillment processes, and you integrate it together. So OK. So I think I spoke a lot for the first 20, 25 minutes. Thank you so much. If you have any questions, let me know. And um, on to the next. Thank you so much, sir, for this wonderful information. Um, any questions from the audience? Uh, I can see a hand over there, and you are also. Can you please give the mic? Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Thank you. Uh, my name is Vishal. I'm from Huntsman. Uh, when you discussed about the feature engineering and obviously having the lot of complexity in the feature calculations and the categorical and having the clusters based on that, how did you actually capture all the data against all those features? Is it a systematic process, integrated process, or is it all basically the mix and match kind of the process? So for, for us, um Good question. Data is key. So if you don't if you don't have the right data, then okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. If you don't have the right data, then um, uh, anything can be questioned. But we had a lot of this data with us, right? So we had demand data for three years. Um, we had uh, service levels for for those times. We had supply quantities which had come into us. Uh, we had all this data, the different factors we are talking. So we were lucky, not lucky. We had planned to have data for the last three years, that's how we, we run with it. So the data was available with us, so we were able to do that. But we didn't have to go outside to collect some of this data. We had most of the data within our, our means. But that 
doesn't mean you shouldn't get external data but we are internally focused right now like i said we are not able to get market inputs into our whole except for sales figures and numbers so uh, it is mostly internal so we had internal data we ran it on internal data can we expand it yes we can add more variables and factors to that which come externally did i answer your question yeah fairly yeah. thank you yeah. yes sir hello good morning all kailash here from tata motors hi kailash uh, very interesting to uh, see the people from the same field and having a different experience but the ultimate aim is becoming the backbone of the industry as a supply chain experts my question is what about the predictive demand judgments for the electric vehicles because there is no data available for us So, Kailash, while I mentioned this, I'm on the space side. So, uh, but I understand your question is if we are going to move to EV, uh, electric vehicles, five years down the line, what is going to be my market and how am I going to predict what what it's going to be? So, I think the answer to that is you don't have data. Um, you have marketing, sales, product planning information. You have external agencies which are talking about who's doing what. So in that case, it has to be not a machine learning or a predictive modeling exercise. It has to be more of a um, what is the likelihood that this scenario unfolds. So that's more scenario planning, which you'll have to do. Um, you will have to rely on your sales and marketing team to give you the right inputs. You will have to rely on your engineering teams to tell you um, where we are as with respect to competition. So you could use competitive data. You could have number of vehicles which are out there and what's the plan in the market. You could use pricing information. So what, what is the segment in which you want to compete and where you're pricing that. Um, you could do some supply side as well, that if my plan is to do X, Y, and Z, will I be able to get the right supplies coming in? So you could use three or four factors, but mostly my understanding is you'll have to make that judgment based on the external factors and not on the internal factors, which include market share, pricing, and your production and sales volume. Maybe that's three things that I would kind of look at and do that. So if, I, I don't know if it answers your question, but OK. OK. okay. Yes, sir. Uh, good morning. I'm representing Fiat India Automobiles, uh, JV between Tata and Stellantis. So my question to you, sir, uh, how you manage, you, you talk about the uh, intelligent data collection and the demand which you can predict. But the manufacturing lead time from the suppliers direct is certainly one of plays an important role. Their tier one, tier two suppliers, the manufacturing lead time and the logistic lead times. How you see, how you can balance between the two so that uh, your service level to the end customers is achieved? So, um, to, to be practical, we are only able to manage our tier 1s. I have pretty much no visibility into tier 2 and tier 3s as of today. Um, tier 1 data is also not very reliable. If you ask me, do most of my suppliers know the lead times? I don't think so. Um, it's a buffer. Um, we have a range from 30 days to 120 days, depending on import, import content. Is that based on some facts? Probably not. But our job is to try and keep them accountable for what they've committed to us and in turn share visibility in terms of what the future holds. So the, what a tier one, tier two wants is give me visibility into what you want me to supply. So we are able to give them some level of uh, predictability in one month's time frame, but two, three, four months, we give them rolling forecasts, right? So we expect them to maintain that bound within that range. So we are able to share data on demand. That's the only thing that we get. We don't get much feedback back from them saying, can I supply you with what you've asked? So today, I don't think um, from a spares perspective, we're able to do that. Maybe our OEM folks are able to get better visibility because they have more volumes in terms of what suppliers. So suppliers are more willing to work with OEMs because the volumes are high. But if you're in a discrete kind of an intermittent and your, your tail, your, your product spreads too long, um, it's, a, it's quite a challenge. I mean, I don't have a right solution. There is no scientific solution. You just have to have people who manage that uncertainty and 
beyond tier 1s and tier 2s and expect tier 1s to manage the tier 2s and tier 3s just like we manage our tier 1s but even that is a challenge i mean it's not a it's it's just tough it's just tough yeah it's just too. it is it is what it is it's just tough well extremely sorry to cut yeah. you so but the um, uh, the time is up and uh, so please stay on the stage uh, we would like to present a small token of appreciation and re uh, request mr logman ceo of uvs forums so thank you so much for your time for your efforts for this wonderful presentation can we come in the center and take a nice photograph i would also like to invite uh, guru anant narayan sir back on the stage we would like to felicitate you sir for the for the wonderful opening remarks thank you so much sir